So, for our Bible majors, they have to write their own doctrinal statement. I think I finally wrote mine out. It's, I think, like 135 pages. But I spent like the third, first 35 pages explaining why I kind of thought it was inappropriate to even do theology. Because it is the study of God, and how appropriate is it for the creature to study the creator? And if we are studying the creator, what kind of disposition should we have? Should it be done with humility, wonder, and awe? Or are we studying God like we're studying a mineral or a virus or some exotic animal? I think that would be really inappropriate. So get that in your mind. And remember, we're going to be very limited. The four Bible majors, they take all the required Bible courses, plus then they're specializing in some field of ministry. And we make them all write their doctrinal statement, and then they have to come into a panel, and we use this sheet of paper, and it has, I think, nine different categories. It starts with interpretation, dispensations. I'm going to get to that later. Um, ecclesiology, that's a fancy word for how the church should be run. Eschatology, that's a fancy word for end times, like when it's, how's the world going to end? When is Jesus coming back? We'll do that later. We'll do that one probably last, because that's the last thing. I want to start with theology proper, who God is, because without that, the rest of it's pointless. And then they have <laughs> bibliology. I always mess with Steve and the Bible teachers. I call it bibliolatry because sometimes I think they exalt the Bible even though God himself can remember. God is the author of the Bible is a book. The book is not a person. When we talk about the living word of God, we're talking about Jesus. I'm not talking about my King James Bible. That's a book with pages that could go into the fire and perish. The living word of God is eternal. It can't, it was never created. It can't be destroyed. But we'll get into that more later. I also today want to talk about pneumatology. Anyone want to take a guess of what pneuma is? Tell us your Latin. Is that Latin or Greek? That's Greek. Shows you how good my Latin is. Pneuma is Greek. Spirit. So. Pneumatology is the study of the spirit. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the Holy Spirit today. We've got anthropology and a fancy word, hamartiology. That is the theory of sin. Like, what is sin? What does that mean to sin? Christology, that's the person and nature of Christ. We'll talk about that today. Um, soteriology, we'll talk about that later. That's a big word for the doctrine of salvation. And then angelology, which is the study of angels. Fascinating. All right. So, starting off, theology proper. Real quickly, I'm going to put this diagram up over here and then come back to my side of the board. But you've probably seen this before. I might have even drawn it for you before. But in the Trinity, in the Christian theology about God, so theology proper, theos. Study of we have God the Father, we have God the Son, and we have God the Holy Spirit. These are not three separate beings, they are one being, and this one being we call God. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But this is very important distinction. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. I don't expect this to make sense because it doesn't really make sense to me how you can have one being with three persons. Um, in a sense, I feel I have a little understanding of this because of Jesus, the Son, who, even though he was God, 
he incarnated into and took on the form of a man. So the son now is fully God, but he is also now taken on humanity. And so we have the God man, but it's not like 50 50. In fact, I shouldn't even draw it like that because it's still, it's like 100% God, 100% man. And there's a lot of different theories on how that works, but we can get into that later. I want to focus here, starting with God proper, and this would apply to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but then each person of the Trinity has a different role and function and relationship. Like, there is a relationship between these two persons of God, even though they're both God. The same God, not different gods, the same God. And it almost sounds like divine multiple personality, sort of. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be recording this. Any questions on that? Okay, what all of these aspects of the Godhead share, however, are these things that we call the omnis. And so when you see omni before a word, it means all, okay, omni. And so under omni, we have a list of, I'm just gonna write omni the first time. We have omniscience. That means God is all knowing. We have omnipresence, which means he's everywhere all the time. There is no place where God is not. Omnipotent, that means he is all powerful. And one of my personal favorites is he's omnibenevolent, which means he's all good all the time. So when we talk about these characteristics of God, these qualities, we have different qualities of God. Remember, it talks about humans were made in the image of God, male and female created in them. Well, we share some qualities with God, like goodness, love, joy, justice, the knowledge of good and evil, those sorts of things we share or can be communicated to humans. But you see how these belong to God alone? No human could be all-knowing, everywhere present, everywhere potent, <coughs> all the time. Hey, Serena. That's more right, are you? Well, she was online. I was impressed. I was the show, so I was I got you. I saw you logged in. That was good. We're just going over the basics of the Christian concept of God. And since I got you in here, I don't know how much you know about Hinduism, but both have a trinity. In Hinduism, you have um, Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. And it's very similar to this Christian idea. It's not exactly the same, of course, but it's similar to this idea of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when I'm teaching my world religion class, I tell them it's kind of like um, the Father's kind of like Brahma, the creator, and the Holy Spirit is kind of like um, the preserver. He sends goodness, helps people. But it's also the Father in Christian tradition that is the destroyer. And that's Shiva, right? The little bit of cosmic dance. And the sun would be probably closest to the idea of um, Krishna, where um, there's an incarnation of Vishnu. And so in Christianity, we have this idea that the sun has always existed. He wasn't created, but he took on humanity in the form of Jesus. But he's still God. But now God is in human form. And even after he resurrected and ascended back into heaven, Jesus is still has a human form for the rest of his life. Which that just blows my mind. Like right? it's not like he just popped down into a human suit and then popped back up into the heavenly places, but he's going to be human. We're actually going to get to interact with Jesus in human form, glorified bodies. Perfect body, but not. He's not just going to be some disembodied spirit. Okay. So 
these are the qualities. And since I got you here, I'm just going to use the cross cultural because I think it's helpful and I love it. And maybe it will help you understand Christianity better. This would be like Paramita Brahma, the God beyond the Trinity, the one that you can't really even describe or know because it's beyond human comprehension. And so that's kind of like what we have here. But then we have God in three distinct personalities or persons Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They all share this, but do you see the paradox now? When you have the incarnation of Jesus, how can Jesus, who has a physical body, be everywhere present? If Jesus was everywhere present, the world would just be full of Jesuses, right? So, how do you deal with that paradox? But it did seem he had awareness of places where he physically wasn't. Like he saw some of the disciples like under a fig tree and things like that. But that's a trick to think about. We, I mentioned there's communicable. And then incommunicable. These are traits God has, like love, mercy, justice, that humans share. These would be traits God has that we don't have, like these. We're not all knowing, we're not all good, we're not everywhere present. Only God has those. Um, it's interesting when we talk about God as well, like how do we know these things about God? And for Christians, of course, they believe one of their biggest sources is through scripture. Which is a, comes about through special revelation. In other words, God had to actually reveal these words or these thoughts or concepts to human beings. It's not something we just discovered through our own reason or our own experience. So this would be special revelation, and the other would be like natural. Like things you can know about God by looking at creation, by looking at humans, by looking at the patterns of galaxies and the stars. Those are things we can see, anyone can see. These you have to have special divine insight to understand. Okay, so th those are those two categories. In all of these cases of the nation of God, we have God is eternal. And what we mean by this is God has always existed. He had no beginning. Now in Christian theology, we talk about the son is the only begotten of the father. How can you have a, the son be eternal if he has a father? Any thoughts on that or ideas how to resolve that problem? This was something the medieval theologians had to wrestle, to wrestle with. Is that a Christian? Yes. And it's a good one, I think. But I'm a Christian. So. <laughs> Maybe if I wasn't a Christian, if I was a Jew or a Muslim, I could do it. That's really my answer. How do you have the son being eternal if he was begotten by the father? Because at least when we think in human terms, you have the father first, then you have the son. In Christian theology, they're saying both of these, all three of these are eternal beings. The way Christian theologians dealt with it is they said the son has been eternally begotten by the father. In other words, there has never been a time when the father and son weren't in this father and son relationship. It's been eternally that way. But because of their love for each other, it is the Holy Spirit that communicates this love from the father and the son. And out of this love, they have eternally shown it through the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Um, just like a parental relationship, and I'm not saying the Holy Spirit is God the mother or God the next generation child. No, these all three are eternal, but 
but they are all unique persons. The Holy Spirit isn't a force or a feeling or a thing or an it. It is a person with a personality, with a role, with a function, with desires. Okay, so eternally begotten by the Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three of these are, except in the incarnation state, we have, I think we talked about this, imminent and transcendent. You guys remember the difference between these two? The imminence of God? This ties into his omnipresence and omniscience. This means God is everywhere present. There is no place where God is not, even including inside this expo marker. God yes, there was no place where God is not, even down to the smallest atomic level between quarks and neutrinos. God is there. Yes, everywhere. Everywhere. Transcendence means. God is not bound or contained within the creation, that he is outside of or beyond. So here's another Christian paradox. You have a God that is inside everything at all places at all times, yet he is outside of and not bound by anything. So he is inside and outside simultaneously. Th this is what I like to tell my philosophy students is, I might have told you this already, uh, one thing you can do that God can't is you can go outside. God can't go outside. Because there's nowhere for him to go because he's already there. Okay. So, okay, so, and this is showing, and there are different sects of Hinduism that believe in this, but other pantheistic groups see God as, as synonymous with nature. This is seeing God as transcending nature. In other words, you could destroy the entire cosmos, but God would not be diminished in the least. Or if you're a strict pantheist and God and nature are synonyms, if the universe is destroyed, God is destroyed. But once again, Hinduism is very complex and you have a huge spectrum of beliefs from this all the way to God. It's interesting, I'm going through Islam right now in my theology class, and one of the things I find really beautiful about Islam is they actually got their like malas from Hindus or Buddhist tradition, where they would do a mantra or something given to them by their guru or to meditate, to focus their mind. Um, Christians use it to do like Our Father or Hail Mary, right? Muslims use it to count the 99 beautiful names of God. So where Buddhist malas have 108 beads, the, and I think Hindus have 111, I think. I think that's in case they figure you might mess up once out of 10, so they add another 10 plus one onto it. <laughs> so you don't leave any up. The Muslims do 99 beads for the beautiful names of God like protector, counselor, provider, and they just go through, and that's a meditation on the way for them to think. And as Christians would agree with those 99 names, and then some. And in fact, in the Old Testament, there aren't really proper names of God. They're more like adjectives or descriptions, like God is my shield, God is my protector, God is my provider, um, God is my salvation. It's not really like proper names like Bob or Betty or Sue or something like that. It's more what he's doing, his role. Okay. So all three of these are involved in the creation of the world. When it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, it's talking about the Trinity, not just the Father, not just the Son, not the Holy Spirit. But God wanting to reconcile the world to himself, the Father sends the Son into the world. And now we get into a whole other set of 
criteria, and I'll go over on this one. I need to pay attention. Okay, we're doing we've got 30 minutes. 20 minutes. I have a fun little video I'm going to show you, and uh, hopefully it won't be too over your heads because it's, it's playing on theology. But I really appreciate these guys, and I think this was in lesson 10? No, lesson 11? Yay, yes. <laughs> Can you can you guys see my share screen? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Pastor. Tell us a bit more about this Trinity thing. Yeah, Pastor. Tell us. But remember that we're simple people without your fancy education and books and learning. And we're hearing about all of this for the first time. So try to keep it simple. Okay, Patrick? Yeah, real simple, Patrick. Sure, there are uh, three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son. Spirit, yet there is only one God. Don't get what you're saying here, Patrick. Stop picking up what you're laying down here, Patrick. Could you use an analogy, Patrick? Sure. Uh, the Trinity is like uh, water, and how you can find water in three different forms liquid, ice, and vapor. That's modalism, Patrick. What? Modalism. Nature heresy confessed by teachers such as Noetus and Sibelius, which espouses that God is not three distinct persons, but that he merely reveals himself in three different forms. This heresy was clearly condemned in Canon 1 of the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and those who confess it cannot rightly be considered a part of the Church Catholic. Come on, Patrick! Yeah, get it together, Patrick! Okay, so basically what they're saying, if you compare the Trinity to water, like, oh, God the Father is like the ocean, and the sun is like um, snow falling on the mountains, and the Holy Spirit is like the river returning to the sea, that is not what we're talking about. That is saying God took on different modes of existence, and there's certain sects of Christians that believe the Father became the Son and then became the Spirit. Not that there's the Father, Son, and the Spirit all at the same time, but that God changes forms or modes. But that's why it's called modalism. And to be very clear, this is considered heresy. So please don't believe that one. Okay, uh, then the Trinity is like the, the sun in the sky, where you have the star and the light and the heat. All oh, that. Come on, Patrick. That's Arianism, Patrick. Arianism? Yes, Arianism, Patrick. A theology which states that Christ and the Holy Spirit are creations of the Father and not one in nature with him. Exactly like how heat and light are not the star itself, but are merely creations of the star. That's a bad analogy, Patrick. You're the worst, Patrick. All right, sorry. The Trinity is like uh, this three-leaf clover. I'm going to stop you right there, Patrick. Okay. The last one, the heresy of Arianism, that was saying that Jesus was not co-equal or co-eternal with God, nor was the Holy Spirit, but like the light of, like the Son, the Father is the Son, I mean, yes, the Father is the S-U-N, sorry, this is so confusing, but the S-O-N 
is like the light or heat that's coming off of the sun, which is the fog. Does that make sense? Man, that was confusing when I was saying it. So <laughs> this is still believed today by like the um, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. They do not believe the Son is co-equal with the Father. They believe, it's a really interesting mantra. They say, um, as we are, God once was, and as God is, we shall be. So they see God as being like a human type being at one point, and he has evolved over time to become this divine thing. <clears throat> but he created us in his image, so we become like little proto-gods that over time, we're going to get to where God is now, but we're never going to be him because he's going to keep evolving too. But they see Jesus as one of his first creations, not as that being that created all things. So that's also considered accuracy or false teaching. Yeah, what was your horses, Patrick? You're about to confess partialism. 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 Yes, partialism. A heresy which asserts that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not distinct persons of the Godhead, but are different parts of God, each composing one third of the divine. And who confesses the heresy of partialism? The first season of the cartoon program, Voltron, where five robot lion cars <laughs> merge together to form one giant robot samurai, obviously. I've never heard of it. Okay. When we talk about the doctrine of the simplicity of God, anyone have any idea what that means? When we say that God is simple, obviously it doesn't mean he's not complex. It means he is one. In other words, you can't divide God. God is the totality of reality. You can't cut him in off a third and say, oh, this is the Holy Spirit part. This is the Father part. This is the Son part. It's all one being, one reality. So you can't do the three-leaf clover thing going, oh, here's the different parts of God. And when you combine them all together, you get the whole big thing. No. Of course, yeah, but it's not going to exist for another 1,500 years now, Patrick. Yeah, get with the program, Patrick. I mean, really, Patrick. I'm going to stab you in the face, Patrick. Obnoxious Irish monks. Okay, that was probably a bit much. All right, I'll try again. Uh, the Trinity is like how the same man can be a husband and a father and an employer. Moralism, Moralism. again. All right, that's like the three layers of an hour. So that's a reason. Fine. Trinity is a mystery which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood only through faith and is best confessed in the words of the Athanasian Creed, which states that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. That we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co equal in majesty. Well, why didn't you just say that, Patrick? Yeah. <laughs> so that's on week 11, if you want to see it again. And the last one was the actual Orthodox position. But it doesn't make sense to the rational mind. That's why they say it's a mystery that is believed by faith. Because in human terms, one plus one plus one does not equal one, it equals three. But in Christian Trinity, one plus one plus one equals one. All right. Any questions? Okay. I do not pretend to understand it. Um, and that's about the best I can do for you. Okay. Oh, was I still sharing? Sorry. Now you can zoom in. Okay, now I want to share something up on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Can you guys see this list that are online? Yeah. Yeah. Any of my online people there? Yes, we can see. Okay, thank you. All right, so now I want to talk about the person of the Holy Spirit. And this is really interesting to me because I was brought up on a much more conservative end of the spectrum. 
where we relied super heavily on the Bible to be our illumination, our guide. It was like God gave us a roadmap or like we were an automobile and it was like the owner's manual, how to take care of your car, when to change the oil, how many times to go to church, how to dress, how to talk, how to eat. And it was the charismatics or Pentecostals that were all about the Holy Spirit and that. And it made my people uncomfortable, especially when it got wild, right? And my churches were very calm, reserved. You stayed in your seat. You didn't raise your hands. You didn't draw attention to yourself. And in a lot of these other churches, it's full on jump and shout. And it's like being at a concert or some of it gets even wilder. And so I really appreciated this guy's list he made of 50 attributes or roles of the Holy Spirit. And instead of being afraid of it, because I wasn't raised in that community, um, and I think it also helps Pentecostal charismatic people to realize there's a difference between the power of the Holy Spirit and just feeling or emotion or being amped up because of the music or someone changed the chords and all the hands go up. Right? <laughs> Have you ever seen that in chapel? You see a chord progression and it's just like, oh yeah. And it's just like, is that the Holy Spirit or is that music affecting people's emotions, right? And so that's what I want people to think about. But check out this list. I, I just want to go through this with you. The Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. In other words, without that in your life, I personally do not believe you can even understand your need for God. Um, you can have a human understanding, but this is a divine understanding. The Spirit guides us to truth. The Spirit regenerates us. In Christian theology, this is how we get new life in Jesus. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not because we said some little prayer. It's not because we went to church. It's the very Spirit itself is giving us new life. The Spirit glorifies and testifies of Christ. It reveals Christ to us. And this is on week 12, if you want to look at this later. The Spirit leads us. The Spirit sanctifies us. That means the Spirit is the one that makes us holy. It's not our workout. It's not our do's and don'ts. It's the very Spirit of God that cleans us and makes us a new person. The Spirit gives us power. It fills us. It teaches us how to pray. In fact, my most profound prayers, I'm not even using words. I'm just before God, sometimes groaning in agony, and the Spirit is somehow using that to tell God what I need. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. This is how I know I'm a Christian. Is God's Holy Spirit inside of me is testifying to my human spirit that I belong to God and I am His. That's my assurance of salvation. That's from Romans 8, 16. It's the Spirit that's producing the good works and fruit in us. That's I'm a good person. It's because I have God's own spirit in me that's producing love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, patience, faith, hope. That's coming from God. The very spirit of God is like flowing through me into the world. The spirit distributes spiritual gifts. Um, this could be discernment, teaching, speakings in tongues, healings, um, apostleship. These things come from God for the saints. Um, the Spirit anoints for ministry. The Spirit washes us. It's the Spirit that makes us clean through the blood of Christ. The Spirit brings unity and oneness. When you're in the Spirit, you will have unity. When you're in the flesh, you will have division. You'll want what you want, when you want it, how you want it. If you're in the Spirit, you're going to want what God wants, how and when he wants it. Um, spirit brings unity. Uh, da, da. Spirit is our guarantee. Spirit seals us, sets us free from the law. Do you want to be free from the law? Well, you need the Spirit. And the Spirit seals us, quickens us. That's an old-fashioned word for makes us alive. He reveals the things of God to us. The Spirit dwells in us. The Spirit speaks through us. He's the agent, and we are baptized into the body of Christ. The Spirit gives us freedom. The Spirit transforms us into the image of Christ. 
The Spirit enables us, supplies us, grants us everlasting lives, gives us access to God. Amazing. It enables us to follow Jesus. That's what I, when I teach my upper end senior level ethics class, one of the questions I ask my students is, what enables you to live out your personal ethic? And for me, the only way I can be an ethical person is with the Spirit of God in me. Because if I'm just trying to do it through my own strength, I'm not that strong. I'm going to do what I want to do, not what God wants me to do. I need the Spirit of God to be a good person. Um, the Spirit casts out demons. The Spirit brings things to our remembrance. The Spirit comforts us. And the Spirit oversees the church. And so I just thought this was a fantastic list. And this is just focusing upon one of the persons of the Trinity. And so these are the unique roles and things that the Holy Spirit does that the Father or the Son, those aren't necessarily their roles. Is this making any sense at all? Okay. So in like eight more minutes, let's let's go over the qualities of the Son. The S O N Son. And in Christianity, of course, we believe the Son is Jesus of Nazareth. Turn to astrology chapter again. Look at those things. You took out the end. Okay. And this is important to me because there's a lot of Jesuses out there, but not all of them are the Jesus of the Bible or of Christianity. And, and that's what I think is important when you hear people preaching Jesus to make sure it's the right Jesus. So this is the Jesus I'm talking about, um, the second person of the Trinity. Um, he was born somewhere between, not just born, born of a virgin. Okay, so that's kind of big. Have you ever, sorry, have you ever seen the movie Zeitgeist? It's kind of talking about how religion's a big conspiracy and all that. And they're basically comparing Jesus to Krishna, to Buddha, to different people. And one of the things they were trying to point out was Jesus wasn't the only one born of a virgin in mythology or history. And they were claiming Krishna was, but I thought his mother was Maya. Do you remember enough about that? No, which is illusion, right? In Hindi or Sanskrit, Maya means illusion, right? So that's a trick to think about. Um, anyways, born of a virgin. And so this is part of how it's important and not just a little extra fact, because this is how you get the God man. Okay, it's divinity uniting with humanity, but Jesus did not have a human father. It, the scripture doesn't go into detail. It just says the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she conceived and was found a child. So how spirit creates physical matter, I do not know. That, to me, it's a miracle, right? First of all, it's a miracle. It's not rationally explained. There's been a story about like, Krishna and the Ramos. So uh, I just read like, like the person who was like, his mother was like the foster mother. But his mother wasn't a virgin, right? No, she was a foster mom, so she adopted him. Because he was God. Got it. All right. Well, that solves that mystery. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, Jesus of. And remember, this is like the Greek or the English name for, for Jesus. In Hebrew, it's Yahshua. Um, or Joshua is how we would say it in English, which means the Lord is my salvation. So this was a common name in, in Israel, Joshua or Yahshua, Yahshua the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah. I'm just going to put of Nazareth so we're not confusing him with any other Jesuses. He's born of a virgin. Um, he was born somewhere between eight 
and 4 BC. And you're like, how can he be for, born eight to four years before Christ yeah. if he's the Christ? Well, it's because some monk doing the calendar messed up the dates. And instead of going back and changing everything, they just kind of left them. But somewhere between eight and four BC is when Jesus, the physical manifestation of Jesus came into the world. He had already existed for all time, for all eternity. But now he is physically coming into the world as a God. So this is what we call the hypostatic union. Which is a $50 theology term. And it means 100% God. 100% man. The God man. Some people have talked about it like, okay, well, here's the God part of Jesus, here's the man part of Jesus, and so when you put those two together, Jesus looks like this. You know, other people would say it's, it's more like putting salt in water, and the divinity just kind of dissipates throughout the humanity. I mean, I'm not enough of a theologian to understand all the nuanced little distinctions between that. I just want it to be clear to you, we're not talking Hercules or demigods. We're talking fully God, fully man. And once again, that's Christian high math, how you get a 200% being. Actually, I did have a mathematical friend explain that to me once, how you could have a 200% being. If 100% of that being is spiritual and 100% of that being is physical, could have one being that hits both of those projections, which I'm not much of a mathematician, but I think that's super interesting. Okay, we have 100% God, 100% man. He lived a perfect life. He was born of the tribe, family, and lineage of David, which fulfilled a lot of the Old Testament prophecies of how God would provide the Messiah. So he wasn't just any Jew. He was of the house of David, who God had already promised in the house of David, who God had already promised an eternal kingdom. He lived a perfect life. He began his public ministry at 30. In the, in the Protestant Bible, we have a gap between his infancy and when he was 13, and, or right before he turned 13. It's kind of called like the hidden or missing years of Jesus. If you grew up Roman Catholic and you have the Apocrypha or the Pseudepigrapha, it, there's books that talk about what Jesus was doing as a child. And I think it's super interesting, but that's a, a little difference between Protestants and Catholics in the Bibles. But he begins his public ministry at 30. His first public miracle is turning water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana. And then um, three years later, at 33, he is crucified. Yes. Um, he is buried in a tomb. A rock tomb with a stone rolled over it, and he resurrects or is raised from the dead three days later. And then ascends into heaven and has promised to come again. So this is the aspect of the sun. Did any of you guys see the shack or read the book? I'm not recommending it to you necessarily because it takes a lot of liberty with Christian um, theology. But what I appreciated about that movie is they were trying to portray the Trinity in like human form. And so 
God the Father started off being like this older black woman, <laughs> but she was taking on this role of the fatherhood of God. And Jesus was kind of like this 30 something mulatto guy, kind of like caramel type skin, dark features, but he was like your bro, the one you could hang out with. You could tell him anything. He was there, he was your buddy. And then the Holy Spirit was kind of like powerful and mysterious. And they had her represented as like an Asian woman. And I just thought, well, I just thought it was creative. Well, what I did like about that movie or that book was it really made me realize I've been kind of like ignoring the Holy Spirit. And I think part of it was because there was a fear factor in the groups I was raised in from the Pentecostal folks. And what I realized is out of fear, I never really studied or developed my relationship with the Holy Spirit like I had with the Father and the Son. Because like when I pray, I pray to the Father in the name of the Son. But now even my prayer life has changed in that depending on what I'm praying for, I may talk to the Father, or I may talk to the Son as like my brother, like, hey, can you walk with me through this? I, I just am overwhelmed. Um, I need the Father to provide. And I've really started talking to the Holy Spirit a lot, like, Spirit, I need your life. I need you to cleanse me. I need you to sustain me. I need you to help me yield, because I can't even yield to you without your help because I'm gonna choose my way, my wants, my desires. And so I know this is just like a 50 minute sketch, but I wanted you to understand the Christian Trinity and the Father, Son, Holy Spirit to the best I could explain them. And hopefully when you get Witten and these more high-end theology classes, that won't just be so overwhelming. Like what are all these big crazy words? And we'll try to tackle the rest of that list on Thursday, all right? Yes. Yeah. And that's focused primarily on the son, but it's to satisfy the righteous requirement of the father. Yeah, I saw that also. Yeah, it's an intense place. Thanks for being with me, guys. And we will pick up on Thursday.